Well, good afternoon, depending on where you're at. Thanks for joining us. I'm Keith Porball, and you're with us on the Contemporary Manual Therapy course, the first one of its kind. And of course, um, coming to you via webinar. I see that we've got a number of you still joining us online. Uh, so please feel welcome to make some notes throughout the presentation. We're going to go for about an hour long. And this is a joint presentation between myself and, and um, Dr. Young, Francis Young. And we are hopeful that we can provide you some highlights about contemporary manual therapy and its management of complex cervical spine disorders. And we'll go through a few things that we feel able to be touched upon in this type of setting. And we'll try to give you some idea of what a full three-day course would look like in hopes that you know, we'll have the opportunity to meet again in the future. And let's see if I can operate these slides properly. So your presenters today, myself, Keith Porball, and Dr. Young, we provide our pictures because obviously we didn't know the first thing about doing a webinar. So we thought, well, you might need a picture of us, I guess, to pick us up out of a lineup or maybe when you recognize us in public and we can actually meet in person during a course. Uh, but to tell you a little bit about myself, I live in Alaska, so you get the benefit of hearing from both the West Coast and the East Coast. Um, I've been an instructor with um, a few different organizations. I started out with International Academy of Orthopedic Medicine and then North American Seminars, and now I work with Mile Pain and particularly Eureka Seminars. Uh, I also have my own clinic here in Wasilla, Alaska, uh, primarily an outpatient clinic specializing in orthopedics and manual therapy. Uh, I've, you might find my name published in some research articles. Uh, and I recently am um, the author of a book that's to be released in a few weeks. So always lots of exciting things going on uh, for us here in Alaska. I'd like to give Dr. Young an opportunity to introduce himself, and then we can begin our discussion. Good, uh, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on where you are. My name is uh, Francis Jung. I do practice in Maryland near Washington, D.C. area. I am also a clinical owner of a, a private practice. I've been practicing about 20 years uh, since the graduation. Uh, I'm interested in uh, understanding a little bit more of a clinical reasoning and then development of how to we can uh, teaching and learning of uh, complex spine disorders. And then uh, we, I'm just happy to hear to be able to share some of the information that may benefit for you and your clinical practice. Excellent, all right. Well, in this venue, most of you realize that your mic is turned off. And so unfortunately, we don't get to hear much about each view, uh, but you will have the opportunity to ask your question. So that's an important part of take some notes. And at the end of this webinar, we're going to allow for some time where we can perhaps post the, the questions and um, go through and try to answer as many as we possibly can. Uh, if you're having any sound problems, that's usually the biggest technical issue, it seems like during these webinars, then it seems like it's best if you sign out and sign back in, or you can immediately start posting questions um, in regards to that. And you know, we have staff working in the background um, that can actually address those issues. So Eureka Seminars is really a, a new venture for mild pain, and all of you are well aware of mild pain and its innovative style and offering standard setting courses, particularly in the area of dry needling. Whereas Eureka Seminars is really trying to bridge the gap. It's offering that same style of standard setting courses with novel approaches and evidence-based methods, 
but more in the area of manual therapy applications that don't involve a needle. Uh, trying to really help clinicians be the, the most well-rounded and have the tools that truly get results. And it doesn't matter where they're from. We've got courses from all around the world. And some of you who have been attending these webinars are familiar with the fact that you've had access to some real um, renowned presenters and covering all areas of topics. And the contemporary manual therapy is really geared towards addressing the manual component of pain management that's been lacking for so long. And our objectives with this course are to integrate those areas we feel are relevant to being a contemporary manual therapist. And that is understanding a movement-based approach. And in this case, we're going to be applying it to the cervical spine. And, and uh, you know, I always remember attending a course with uh, Chris Powers and just hearing him adamantly talk about the one title we have not yet relinquished as physical therapists is the movement expert. And we really need to use that in the cervical spine where movement is critical. And we're going to look at ways to apply evidence-informed clinical reasoning and the pain science models. So appreciating the fact that pain is not a pathology when it comes to musculoskeletal pain. And it's really according more so to the pain and movement reasoning model outlined by Jones in 2014, that it's, it's an output involving a complex interaction of all the, the systems. They're simply just trying to move towards homeostasis. We're gonna offer a case study that Dr. Young has put together for us to show how we can guide our rationale for the pain mechanisms in a multimodal approach. And then we'll look at implementing aspects of the kinematic chain, considering how we apply our screening that's mostly influenced by clinical practice guidelines, and then talk about some of the methods that we would use in our approach. And some of you might be saying, hey, why do we need another manual therapy course? Uh, you know, there's so many choices out there already. And to me, what makes me passionate about building this course is it's not about me. It's not about Francis. It's not about Jan. It's not about any one of us and how we practice our particular art. Instead, it's about bringing to you the best of the best and looking at methods and approaches which are truly guided by evidence and trying to make sure that we have the tools we need based upon the results they get rather than having one particular profession represented or one particular um, person represent so i'll be honest most of the techniques we show uh you know we didn't create we borrowed from whoever we needed to borrow to give you the skills and techniques you need to create the effect we're trying to do. And our effect, again, is based on that movement science, understanding that we must restore the orthokinematics. We must have that tissue gliding throughout the neuromuscular skeletal system. And we have to do it with a language that respects the pain matrix, that's therapeutic neuroscience education, helping people see movement as fun, as purposeful instead of painful. And of course, using the typical principles that have shown to be time-tested effective, like short levers, doing high velocity, low amplitude, avoiding the pitfalls that you can have with manual therapy when it's not have the right timing or when it maybe isn't appropriate for that patient. And that's really what drove us to develop this course and to not be guided by you know, one person's um, style, but instead a style that works well for our entire profession that would allow us to be successful with the application of manual therapy in the face of all the current science. And that's represented well for us in the literature. Um, one of the things pointed out by Raby's study was he acknowledged, this was back in, um, I think it was 2017, talked about the fact that there's been some 
um, controversy around the use of manual therapy um, as a sole modality. And a lot of people claim that it's because you don't know what segment you're on, or you have no way to truly assess movement in one particular region versus another. And therefore, how could you say you were actually effective? But really, manual therapy is most appropriate and most effective when it's performed in light of the current pain science. And it follows a patient-centered approach, just like any other mode of intervention that we would apply. So yeah, manual therapy doesn't stand alone. It stands within, within our approach to try to treat the whole patient rather than just one area of pain. And we try to apply that within the evidence-based medicine described by SAP. And that's where all of us yearn to be experts, because we know that, yes, manual therapy is just another modality or intervention, but it's one that requires great skill, because we are in that patient space, and we are trying to create change and movement with our hands. So it's a lifelong endeavor, seeking expertise. And that's part of where this course came out of, both my search and Francis' search, and learning so many approaches that we want to share that help people be more successful with developing manual therapy expertise. But in the same regard, understanding that there's a way, there's a method, almost a style of determining what are that patient's expectations in regards to our approach, because that is also very valuable into determining whether or not we're doing evidence-based care. And lastly, of course, being good consumers of evidence. We try to provide plenty of evidence throughout the, our course. You'll get a touch of it here. Um, you know, hopefully it'll be something that we can come back to later on and see how that would be applied. You'll have plenty of opportunity to ask questions. Um, we're going to talk about blending some evidence with the manual therapy, and we'll look at some management that has been shown to be more effective for the type of disorders that we're going to be addressing. So why do we pick neck pain? Oh, well, neck pain is a perfect area for us to start our program just because of the fact that it's so common it, that we tend to learn to live with it. I mean, really, the estimate of neck pain that actually causes activity limits is only about 2 to 11%. But really, the typical prevalence is anywhere from 30 to 50%. And it doesn't decrease much for adolescents. So most of us and many of our clients, we simply just live with neck pain. And one of the things we realize about neck pain is that it does have a link to poor psychological health where we don't know if it causes it or if it's a preceptor, but if someone's stressed or depressed or anxious, those types of things could increase either the incidence or the severity of neck pain. So it's a perfect area for us to apply that multimodal approach where we know we have to treat not only the musculoskeletal system, but also that neurophysiological system that we have to address the psychosocial. And neck pain is also one of those areas where the first indication is often being, hey, let's look at the image. And in this landmark study by Brzezinski in 2015, and I said Brzezinski, um, he really points the obvious out to us that really the spine is destined to degenerate. And it degenerates more as we age. And so many of the findings that we get kind of pointed out to us as being the cause of neck pain could actually be physiological. There are normal age-dependent conditions where the tissue is on the clock. And so really, it does not exactly you know, serve as a smoking gun of what's causing this person's neck pain. And many people will point to this particular study and say, hey, look at that. If you're over the age of 50, 
Your 80% of people, even though they don't have symptoms, 80% of people are likely to demonstrate this degeneration on imaging. And what we're missing is the connection that this study outlines for us, that it's not just about structure, but most musculoskeletal pain is about structure and function. And that's really what we, we try to address throughout our discussion on nonspecific neck pain. And we're going to take you through a case that's going to help clarify that even more. Before that started, I was very tired and uh, weak, and I feel uh, cold hands and weakness in my hands, like I'm not uh, controlling everything right. And the next day, what happened in the park, I feel very dizzy and very weak, and then I call, uh, I go to, I went to the, to the emergency. And then after that, I feel dizziness with nausea. I took uh, Mecosin. Uh, for five days, and then I felt pressure in my ears and in my uh, head, uh, back head, back to head, and uh, I took uh, salt to feed something like that for the breast sinus pressure. So I'm better in my ears with the pressure. I feel a lightly bad pressure here and in the back of the head, and uh, dizziness was. Uh, uh, almost went, go, went away, but then when I started with physical therapy for neck pain and uh, low back pain, it uh, happened again uh, when they put me heat uh, with electricity in the, in the neck. Uh, all that uh, afternoon and tomorrow, how they I felt was distance, and then started to be better, but I'm still with that issue. So, after listening Susan's, Susan's stories uh, presenting with a clinical uncertainty, I like to have you give you uh, two questions that uh, for you to think about. First question is that uh, does this uh, Susan belong to the clinic, asking you about level one decision makings? And the number two question to you is that if you think the case is uncertain, then as your physical therapist, how would you proceed with this case? Next, please. Before the Body diagram is a useful tool to help us generate probable hypothesis in early stage of clinical reasoning. As you, as you see from the slide, on the left side of the body diagram, describe Susan's complaints, which are somewhat familiar to our uh, daily clinical practice for patients coming in for the neck pain. On the right side, and as a below of the body diagram, you can see some unfamiliar descriptors of her problems such as pressures in the ears, dizziness, nausea, and hypersensitivity to cold. Furthermore, she has developed anxiety and fear of not knowing what is going on with her. So it creates some little bit more of the understanding and then how we are gonna be able to proceed with this in this uncertain cases that we're gonna go back to review those later on slides. In the early slides, Dr. Kiss talked about classifying non-specific neck pain patients into common subgroups to help us manage the patients. Similarly, in uh, the WIT study performed three levels of Delphi surveys to categorize non-specific neck pain into five common clinical patterns. As you see in the bottom of the figures, you can see the different nature of uh, common conditions they put it into. Furthermore, uh, what's more interesting is that uh, they put those common clinical parents into 
underlining pain mechanisms be able to integrate the concept of pain neuroscience. In general, all of these mechanisms occur at the same time as a continuum. However, there may be a clinical dominance of one mechanism over the others. For example, a patient client with a neural dysfunctions can be predominantly, predominantly classified as pain processing issues and less contribution from the both inputs or output processing. As you see from the Zen's videos. And uh, what do you think is the uh, overall impression of her movement? What seems to be contributing to her mechanism of her moral outputs? She seems to be quite struggling with these simple movements. This slide will capture some of understanding of Jane's movement patterns into complexity of pain experience. That means that uh, it's be able to integrating multi-dimensional neurometrics into a combined clinical reasoning for manual therapies. This model describes three categories in the triangular structures. and the top, there is central modulations. In the bottom, regional influences and local stimulations. This model allows us to have a balanced approach utilizing both biomechanical and psychosocial framework. Our coursework, contemporary manual therapy coursework, will have this balanced model as our foundation of teaching and learning. Next, please. Key management of a model of our contemporary manual therapy courses is based on a patient-centric models using multi-level treatment methods. Optimally, I will get to know how to integrate these treatment sections in a continuum of comp comprehensive management, such as uh, you can initiate with manual therapy and then moving into the sensory motor control and then try to get into the functional rehabilitation. Yes. And Continuing to that impression of how our patients present, what we're trying to do is essentially determine, do our clients fit more into a pattern that's more about articular? Is it more myofascial? Is it sensor motor? Is it pain type of control, muscular endurance? Basically, they have pain with movement. And which pattern is most represented through their history and through our exam? That's really what we're trying to essentially filter out through our assessment so that we can be more specific in our management strategy. And really our, our management strategies require us to appreciate that it's a balance of art and science uh, because we're hands-on and because we're feedback guided. We have to be willing to ask the patient to give us some information in regards to, hey, is this technique, is this exercise, is this movement, is it valuable to you? Does it make sense? Is it comfortable? Uh, not just you know questions about what's your pain rating, but questions about how is your function changing? So we can get a better assessment about are we affecting stability? Are we affecting movement, sensor motor control, those types of things? So our strategies for movement are mainly based upon manual therapy. And we try to incorporate techniques that allow both provider and patient 
the choice that, you know, it might be that you do best in sitting. You know, someone that has dizziness may not want to lie down. So we have manual techniques that seem to work well in a, in a sitting position. Or it might be that we need to focus more on prone or, or even sideline. So we try to really have a, a good balance of techniques that we've learned from the experts, whether it's Hartman or Gibbons and Tehan or, or even some of the more legendary ones like James Syriacs. But we also take in, you know, more novel approaches from recognized practitioners of manual therapy today. Uh, we really look at the literature to see what has some recent evidence and try to appreciate the levers and forces that we use as being the appropriate dose to get just enough force to achieve the measured effect. And always appreciate we have to test before and after our manual techniques. For our stability strategies, uh, we're going to look at the fact that we are trying to retrain awareness of position. And we're going to ask for new motor patterns and some motor learning. So we have to have an approach that is very strong um, on both intrinsic and extrinsic feedback. And we have to have a graded introduction of stability challenges. Now, I'd like to go through where we look at going from static to dynamic, or symmetric to asymmetric, or from supported to unsupported. So I use the three S's and kind of play with a little bit of each one to allow that person to have more challenge as they move through the process. For our neural dynamic strategies, we're looking at trying to create space and freedom of movement, or even better yet, flow. And what type of flow? Nerve flow. And we're doing it by introducing movements, proximal and distal. And depending on whether the patient is appropriate for these types of techniques, depending on the presence of ridiculous symptoms or not. Our sensory motor strategies are paramount and occur pretty much with any of our treatment um, approaches. Um, like Julia Trelin pointed out in 2007 that, you know, ignoring cervical afferents in the presence of neck pain would be like ignoring lower limb proprioceptive training in the presence of an ankle sprain. You know, we, we know that that's the first thing we have to address when we're dealing with a lower extremity injury, but yet we often ignore it in the approaches to the cervical spine, even though it's quite important to retrain. For aerobic conditioning, it's still important, even with neck pain, to find ways to help our patients um, see movement as valuable. In a sense, getting movement that restores the pump, the natural muscle pump to improve nutrition flow, and that allows them also to learn valuable techniques like ground to standing. How do you get up from the floor? It's something a lot of times people don't realize is impaired with neck pain. Traction strategies are really important because we're dealing with a total or general technique that we rule out any presence of instability and that we limit these types of approaches to more of a disc or neurogenic pattern. And of course, our pain behavior strategies are, you know, it's not just about talking people out of their pain. We do want to explain the pain mechanisms and educate our clients into understanding the real role of pain and the processes behind it that hurt does not always equal harm. But we also want to find ways to make movement fun again and use some distraction or some extrinsic based training almost in a sense playing with movement so that we can ensure that they start to see movement as being valuable in their treatment program. So hopefully this is all making sense and you can keep that in the back of your mind. Unfortunately, I would perform any methods, but at least you kind of know what our approach is and our strategy would be in dealing with a client. So we would go back to that first case that we talked about. Susan talks about 
the main complaint of uh, dizziness. In general, the incidence of dizziness uh, has increased 37% during a recent 10 years in emergency visits. However, more than 50% of cases in ER visits were underdiagnosed. For this reason, it is very important to determine what seems to be underlying ideology and then whether the dizziness can be managed conservatively by physical therapists or it requires outside reference. Cause of dizziness can be a result of dysfunctions in multiple systems. In order to establish clinical relationship between dizziness and musculoskeletal influences, we need to have a systematic framework be able to guide us what to do. Here is a four-step clinical decision-making flow how to manage a patient with dizziness and that dizziness originate from cervical spine. Me and my colleagues uh, published uh, this decision-making paradigms uh, in JOS, JOS uh, PT. This framework is uh, based on hypothesis-driven deductible clinical reasoning. As you see from the slide, first two steps are designed to obtain history and behaviors of dizziness, and also it helps to lower likelihood of other possible sources of dizziness by comparing contrasting aspect of a thinking process. Last two steps are focused on gathering a cluster of items to assist physical therapeutic diagnosis of subacogenic dizziness, as well as to provide proper management strategies. Suzan is a 31-year-old female, mother of two children. As we see from her present medical history, she did not have any current or previous history of risk factors associated with cardiovascular profiles. She also cleared by her family positions with different systems. Interesting enough that she had a history of reflex associated disorders to head and neck a few years ago. Recent MRI indicated cervical disc, uh, cervical disc degenerations. But interesting enough, for the development of dizziness, she didn't really have a particular mechanism of injuries, but condition itself was self-limited until she presented with recurrent dizziness upon a physical therapy visit for neck and back pain. Once patient profile is screen is completed, understanding of dizziness behavior is investigated, be able to identify common contributing factors. Her main dizziness described as unsteadiness, lightheadedness, and nausea, but she didn't complain of any vertigo. She also reported that she felt more dizziness as her pain and stiffness in the neck increases. She also presented that there is temporal relationship of dizziness according to changes of neck and body positions. At the first step, we can likely be able to lower probable hypothesis related with cardiovascular or metabolic systems. 
even though Sujan provided some clues of possibility of cervical implants of her dizziness, we still have to investigate remaining systems as a priority by utilizing exclusion of other diagnoses to be able to understanding dizziness in nature. So this, uh, in this process, is try to reduce any cognitive, cognitive errors associated with early confirmation or premature closure. In the second step, clinical examination was followed. You can go to the next slide. Sujan did not present with any consistent sign and symptoms that representing contraindications or precaution related medical conditions. As you see from the red flag screening, we can be able to try we can be able to exclude conditions like cervical arterial disorder, cervical instability cervical cosines. She also had intact urological testings, except for symptoms associated with oculomoral and vestibular testings during cranial nerve testings. These videos are indication of abnormal inverted supinal reflexes in a patient with neck pain. And the testing is supposed to be elicit elbow flexion uh, during this reflex testing, but uh, in abnormal signs, you can see the finger flexions. And then, and then those testings are generally one of the underutilized testings that we use in clinical practice. Tectorial membrane, membrane testing is one of the testings to determine cervical instability and then it has a high diagnostic values. These two testing is just example of what kind of testing we should be able to implement when, you, we, when we are negating a client with uncertainty by providing consistent urological examinations. Upon completing sensory motor items, as you see from the older items associated with try to understanding of any condition related with a vestibular dysfunctions, she did not demonstrate any abnormal signs that suggest of either central or peripheral vestibular pathologies. However, as you see from the uh, testings that Sujan presented with visual disturbance with symptoms of dizziness during those uh, two testings. In general, if you were not be able to understanding of abnormal sign of smooth pursuits, then as you see from the, these videos, then you can see a corrective catch up saccadic eye movements. So, so smooth person movement, eye tracking movement is not that smooth, then you can be able to see. But uh, Sujan actually didn't, did not have this sign of uh, symptoms, this sign of testings, but there was some symptom associated with it. Here's uh, another list of uh, vestibular examinations, try to determine, try to ruling out any condition associated with unilateral vestibular dysfunctions, or try to understanding is there any uh, abnormal peripheral vestibular inputs to developing central vestibular regions. Both dix pike and roll testing are designed to rule out any possibility of a benign proximal positional vertigos. The reason being that uh, we have to do this testing is that patient with presenting with a BPVB in nature do presenting very similar characteristics of dizziness 
originate from cervical spine. At the end, there is possible motion sensitivity testings, and these findings are also corresponding with Susan Dyson's behavior, like a temporary relationship with Dyson's provocation associated with changes of neck and body mechanics. Just in case that if we have not seen any abnormal segments, you can see a delayed onset and then short duration of directional segments during the role testing. After the exclusion processing of all other possibility of a systems review, now we can be able to start to increase possibility of musculoskeletal, musculoskeletal influences and try to rule the possibility of vestibular dysfunctions. To confirm these regions, now we can be able to uh, looking into whether Susan fits into any typical clinical patterns that suggest of dizziness originate from cervical dysfunctions. That's why uh, after this testing that uh, there is change of hypothesis orders. As we, see, um, uh, as we see from the picture of Susan, we can be able to understanding there is some change of postural postures, indication of a full health pressure, typical upper cervical cross syndrome, and then there is muscle tenderness and trick points in, in the neck and head muscles groups. Those findings are quite a bit of a correlate with common muscular conditions that suggest of a subcogenic dizziness behavior, dizziness presentations. Also, evidence supports that impairments in those items can affect sensory motor controls in the head and neck, and then those are also important casual and perpetuating factors. This video is an indication to how to testing upper cervical mobility between C1 and C2. As far as we know that there is a high sense of joint positional receptors located in C1 and C2, and then there is a function right at this level, then we can be able to estimate there is some degree of depression of proprioceptor functions that may alter overall sensory motor controls. And going through our examination, as we begin to filter out those areas that essentially have met our inclusion criteria, and we see that we are truly dealing with a musculoskeletal disorder. And we begin to look at the, some of the testing with a broader view and understand that our joint mobility um, does not stand alone. Yes, the cervical spine is notorious for compensation. If we find a stiffness in one region, we're likely to find an instability in another. But we can begin to understand that better with some of these tests that isolate us to information from one region versus another, like the cranial cervical flexion test or the smooth pursuit neck torsional test. And these tests have been shown to have very high specificity in regards to conditions like dizziness. But also even more important is just it gives us an indication that we cannot ignore the influence of the cervical afferent system. And the joint position error is one of those tests that allows us to both assess and treat um, interruptions in the cervical mechanoreceptors. So you've talked about this test, the cranial cervical flexion test. It's been around for quite some time. And the idea is that we use a pressure sensitive device to give us information about the ability to activate the deep neck muscles. And that's gonna be the longest coli and the longest cavity. And for really most purposes, we're gonna see that 
the activation should get us anywhere between the range of you know, 18 to 24 mercury, depending on the device that you're using. And that's an asymptomatics would be considered normal. Where the smooth pursuit, pursuit neck torsional test involves a method of tracking with the oculomotor system where we're looking at rotation, both in a neutral position, and then by way of a, a rotating chair, we have the person align their trunk 45 degrees to one side, and then we repeat the tracking test and looking for that smooth pursuit, any presence of the saccadic eye movements. But this test could also be considered positive if it provoked the patient's complaint of dizziness. And for joint position error, we can use a device that could a um, patient wear on the head like a laser. Um, I remember years ago using like a, a plug dam with a straw and a ping pong ball taped to it. Um, so it doesn't have to be as high tech as a laser, but the idea is that we want to get an assessment about the ability to return the head to a position that's either determined by the client or the patient and looking for any um, error and typical error that we'd be concerned about if it's more than four and a half degrees in one particular direction. So in taking all this information in, into our, our stepwise process, what we see is that we have the few yeses. So yes, we have the neck pain and stiffness. Yes, we have the temporal relationship. There is a presence of forward head posture. Um, you know, there's a restriction in joint mobility. And we have some positive indicators for um, a, a dysfunction of the sensory motor system. And putting all that information together helps us understand how pain can influence proprioception and how we have to take more of a systematic approach to truly implement techniques and methods that are going to achieve changes in movement. Because if we just rely on one modality, like manual therapy, without addressing the postural stability, without addressing the eye movement control or the, the head control, then we're going to seriously be lacking in our expected outcomes. So our specific proprioception assessment mainly looks at the kinesthesia force sense and the joint position error. So realizing that those control mechanisms can be altered by pain, by effusion, by trauma or fatigue. And proprioception is really expected to be impacted in practically every gradual onset musculoskeletal pain disorder, according to um, Clark and Trey Laven. A little bit more non-specific would involve just looking at the balance, the oculomotor and the eye head coordination. And either way, we're trying to get a sense of what is the sensor motor control and how is it influencing the head. Taking that into our final step of our assessment and our clinical decision-making model is that we will actually implement a treatment technique, whether it's one of the mobilizations that we looked in our mobility strategies, or whether it's more of our stability intervention, which may be more appropriate for this case since we have so much of a leaning towards a sensory motor dysfunction pattern. But we implement a trial treatment and then continue to assess those different testing methods so that we can begin to appreciate if we are on the right track, if we're actually applying treatment that is effective and that meets the client's expectations. So integrating all these eventually is what we want to do, is where, yes, we're doing something respect tissue gliding. We're trying to restore joint kinematics. We're also trying to address the fact that there's some muscle deconditioning, there's loss of cervical afferents, and that we have to retrain movement without having the pain emphasis. 
So you can see the list is quite long. Um, this would not be day one or even week one. This would be over time we've developed a toolkit for this patient to address this complex system that is involves some of the, the most accurate and fastest movement in the body. And we're going to influence that to restore movement to reduce pain. And actually, in Susan's case, her outcome was really pretty significant. Um, she finished her treatment regimen with literally no sensor motor items. Dizziness was fully resolved, neck pain fully resolved. Um, she still had some issues with headaches now and then. And overall, she had excellent findings on her outcomes because of a, a specific approach and that patient centered style. So what we hope for all of you is that you can see some value in this type of learning model. Uh, not that we're going to show you any technique that's better than any other course out there, but that we're going to show you how to use the techniques and, and how to apply them in a way that you're addressing the entire pain problem from a systematic approach rather than just having one particular strategy. And we're gonna look at evidence-guided assessment and a multimodal treatment strategy. And considerations for your next case, you know, I'd like you to really take some of this knowledge and apply it in the sense, even if you look at the fact that what is the purpose behind some of those testing methods you're doing when you understand, for instance, our sensor motor assessment. If it's there, we know it's there. What can you have to test it and see a difference after treatment? So whether you do the smooth pursuit test or the joint position error, uh, or whether you're looking more for force generation with the cervical flexion test, but having some measures that you can use before and after to see what is the effect I'm achieving here? Because the last thing we want to do is just rely on pain as a measure of our success. So I welcome all of you to attend our full length course when it is eventually scheduled. And don't fret, it will be scheduled eventually. Um, we wish you all the best during this time. We thank you for joining us throughout this presentation. We'd like to ask you to join us for our future presentations, the Beyond Dry Needling webinars. And the live chat, getting to the point, is coming back soon. We have our schedule posted online essentially every Tuesday from 5 to 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can take a little time out of your evening and catch a webinar from some of the experts in our field. So I hope you do that. And also, don't forget to share with others. And just wanted to point out one of our favorite charity organizations. And thank you again for joining us. Name a book. Someone's asking me name my book. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. I wasn't going to plug it. Um, the name of my book is Healing Power of You. It's actually coming out from a branch of Simon Schuster. It's called Archway Publishing. It be, should be published by the end of this month. Um, it's really a book geared more to patients talking about um, essentially pain mechanisms and how they can use movement to heal and also addressing the wellness aspects of healing. Um, which test do you rely on for ruling out instability? Francis, would you like to address that? Yes, I, th I think the uh, try to understanding of a clinical instability, I think you can have uh, two aspects. One is the subjective aspect of uh, five day, uh, three and five days. And then uh, especially for the testing, if you suspecting the high suspicion of a prevalence of people, folks may have this cervical instability test, instability, then sometimes testing can be considered as dangerous. But one of the testing called a sharp pulse testing is designed to reduce their patient's uh, complaints and associated symptoms. 
So if you considering doing um, testing that I'll start with general cervical movement testing to see willingness of movements. And then you can go ahead moving into the sharp pulse testing, whether you can be able to eliminate symptoms. And then further, you can have a cluster of testing, a la ligament testing, and then uh, pectoral membrane testings, and then there's AAI uh, ligament testing that you can use in it. Those testings has high value of diagnostic testings, but it can be somewhat dangerous if we have a patient has high risk of cervical instabilities, like a patient with cranial cervical instability patients, usually we see those patient groups in hypermobile patient groups, then testing can be a little bit dangerous. So I think the, I think the just take home message is that you have to always value whether this testing can add in additional information and then try to balance out for whether you can harming or not harming by adding testings. But when these are clear, then definitely I think you can be able to, to do testing in a certain patient groups, be able to understand the nature of conditions. Another question we have is looking at, what we consider looking at scapular humeral reflex in this case? Uh, I think that's a great question. Um, scapular humeral reflex looking at, you know, basically uh, Shimitsu uh, reflex looking at the mid cervical spine and potentially any influence that it could have in a patient presentation. Uh, definitely uh, a very valuable uh, tool for assessment. Uh, not something we included just because of time sake and trying to limit um, some of our um, presentation to those areas where we thought would just be kind of novel approaches for people to consider. Uh, Another question: Have any is there any relation between tinnitus and neck pain? Again, a great question. I've I've definitely <coughs> seen it on a case basis. Uh, Francis, have you seen that in the literature at all that you know? Yes, uh, there is a Pew study was published uh, in a few years back called uh, Subacogenic uh, Tinnitus, and the study was looking into the patient group that who has trig point in sternocleid mastoid muscles. And because of the as you understanding of uh, general peripheral pain sensitization and central pain sensitizations, SGM do have a widespread pain into the eye and forehead, as well as into the ear. So some case study was published that by treating trig point developed in sternocleid mastoid muscle do have influence on reducing the tinnitus. So there's some study was uh, published, but also I think if you understanding of uh, tinnitus, then we have to go through the similar process that we demonstrate in this case, using exclusion of other diagnosis, be able to understanding the musculoskeletal influence to tinnitus and neck pain. And, I, and I, one other question I see on here is on motion x-rays. Um, do we ever use motion x-rays? I can't say I do. Um, you know, really, I. Most of our time, we're trying to focus on the fact that we have some ability to look at movement without reliant on imaging. But I can see how some might find that to be useful. Um, could persistent headaches related to myofascial trig point, sternocleidomastoid, and suboccipital um, benefit from dry needling? Uh, well, yes, definitely. We would always encourage using you know, a direct method of intervention when we're dealing with myofascial trigger points like dry needling. Uh, so I definitely think that could play a role. Again, uh, we would easily incorporate other techniques or other interventions, but um, the dry needling, dry needling aspect, we pretty much leave to the myopain side, but it is definitely valuable in this case. 
going back into the adding a little bit more information about the motion x-rays and mm -hmm. I think if you suspecting a patient that presenting with cervical instability uh, it is important that you can uh, co uh, collaborate with the referring doctors be able to order a dynamic uh, x dy dynamic x-rays or dynamic MRIs and then in certain cases that you can see the clibo axial angulation changes with a poly flexion poly extension if the patient has marginal displacement of those movement pattern at C0 to and C2 and uh, then you can suspecting high risk of a cranial cranial cervical instability it can presenting like a uh, brainstem sy syndrome and the vaginal syndromes that you can suspecting in a, in a, in a way so it is important that uh, if you're not so sure then it is always good to have uh, having that referral source kind of a came into the same uh, decision making together because in, in general I think the, the doctors doesn't have much time to understanding of a patient's complaint and then understanding their main subjective complaints uh, so we can be able to uh, put the uh, bridging together for that. Yes, yeah, and I think it's important to keep in mind that x-rays are, you know, when you're looking at moving our motion x-ray, you're looking at something that's 2D, movement's 3D, obviously. And so we can't really make a judgment based off a movement x-ray because that's why we call it, you know, it's clinical cervical spinal instability. It's not objectified, uh, and we can't objectify if we can't truly measure whether or not there's 10 degrees of rotation or three to four millimeters of excess of translation. So we have to appreciate the limits within imaging. But yeah, if we needed to corroborate what we already see with our testing, no problem. But I would never want to recommend that that's going to be something we would use as a basis for how we proceed with our treatment. But yeah, definitely useful. All right, so we're going to end this webinar. We thank all of you for attending. Um, Francis, I really enjoyed it. Hope that we um, didn't have too many glitches, and we hope that you join us again in the future. Thank you.